Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Kansas City jazz pianist and vocalist Candace Evans. We caught up with this very popular and versatile musician on the Midwest scene to talk about her life in jazz and this strange new COVID-19 jazz world with no live shows during early May 2020. Candace has performed a wide variety of music like jazz, classical, pop, Latin, Broadway, and soulful ballads to all kinds of crowds. She has been at this since the age of eight, receiving top honors while she attended and graduated from Shawnee Mission East High School. She opened up about this and so much more. Please dig it, and this just happens to be the 1,000th interview for Neon Jazz. Good morning, Candace. Oh, hi, Joe. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thanks for taking a minute after Neon Jazz. Oh, absolutely. I'm honored. I've been wanting to interview you for a while, and this is probably one of the more surreal times on this planet, so I think it's probably good to talk about music. Yes, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so, but let, let's get let's get some of this business out of the way here. We are, I mean, this, there there is going to be a part of this that will be COVID-19 related, and mm-hmm. what I want to know up front is we're going to get to a point where this, like, time period of around May, March 12th to 13th is going to be this, wow, what were we doing before then? How did you realize that all these dominoes were falling and live jazz was just getting silenced? Oh, my goodness. Well, I guess, you know, back in early March, I guess, I, you know, I had all these gigs booked, um, and I started thinking to myself, what is going to happen here? And, you know, I just listened to the news, and it was getting worse and worse. And I got to the point where I just thought that every gig that I went to, this was going to be the last time for quite a while. And I have worked for the last two years at the Intercontinental Kansas City at the Plaza Hotel. And it's just been a wonderful, wonderful run. And, you know, I was playing one night, and then you could see the TV out in the uh, lobby area, and you could see the news about COVID-19 and all of that. And there was a new manager that had just started. And uh, I felt so sorry for her because at the end of our gig, she had to come up and say, you know, this is going to be the last one indefinitely. And, you know, I mean, I kind of knew it was coming, but it was still quite a shock. And then, <laughs> it, it, like you said, it's like the dominoes just kept falling. I think I lost every single job I had in a matter of two weeks. And I play a lot of private events. And, you know, that's a lot of my income from private events because normally you, you get paid more for those than you do for clubs and restaurants, et cetera. So, you know, it was it was bad, really bad, those two weeks. In light of that, um, what, what are you doing to keep your creative ed fulfilled, so to speak? Well, it didn't take long before I, you know, kind of got tired of just practicing on my own so I decided I would just record some snippets of music, and I actually, I also like to my classical music, because actually my background is in classical music, but I love jazz too, of course, but I recorded some Elton John tunes, and I just posted them on Facebook, and I could not believe the reaction, and so I, I just have been doing that, you know, one or two videos a week. I haven't been doing the live streaming like a lot of artists are doing. But these videos have really become popular with people. And it's really weird because all of these people that had never heard me play before, and I've been playing for years and years, you know, are listening to these and saying, I've got to come out and hear you, you know, when things get better again. So it's like I've gained this whole new audience. So it's really helping to cheer people up, lift spirits, which is my main goal. And it also keeps me on my toes and keeps me practicing and sharp. You know, you've been at this for a long time, and now that we have this absence of live music, I know it's painful for musicians. What good memories are you drawing on, whether with collaborating with other musicians or gigs you've had? What are you drawing on right now to stay strong and to keep your chin up? What I've been talking about for years is doing another album, and, of course, you know, when you're not making any money, because this is what I do, and this is how I make a living, but um, I am thinking a lot right now about 
doing a new album, and I'm talking to a few of my musician friends about that. And I think that's really kind of keeping us motivated because you can go into a studio and, and, and social distance. I really need that to, to stay creative. And so that's what I'm looking forward to right now. You are, you graduated from Shawnee Mission and you've been in the area. Talk to me a little bit about your childhood growing up and how jazz became your life. Well, my dad uh, was stationed um, in the war and his war, um, and he was a guitarist and a vocalist of sorts. And he had all this old sheet music that his mother had given to him. And, and when I was very young, I picked up those pieces and uh, tried to figure them out. And then my mom started me with piano lessons and kind of went off from there. Like I said, my background was in classical music, classical piano and voice. Uh, but my parents listened a lot to Billie Holiday, um, Nancy Wilson, um, Sinatra, and my favorite was always Nat King Cole. Play the piano was something really amazing. Most people don't realize that he was an incredible jazz pianist before he became popular as kind of a mainstream vocalist. So I would just listen for hours to that music and um, just decided I'm going to do this. So that's how it all started. What was the first live jazz show you saw that really, really motivated you? Actually, my first gig was years ago at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel uh, playing piano. Um, played for six years there, actually. But I would go um, quite often after my gig. I would go up to Jardine's up the street. I don't know if you remember Jardine's. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was the spot, and every, everyone still misses it. But I would just go sit there and listen night after night, and then finally I had uh, the nerve to get up and participate in a jam session. And the owner liked what I did, and it kind of went from there. But I guess that was really, you know, my first eye-opening experience to jazz, at least in this town. So what was the first live show that you saw, like a live jazz show, that really blew your doors down? Oh, gosh. Well, I grew up listening to... uh you know, pop and rock music, actually. Um, I would say, it, you know, it was it was as I got a little bit older when I started going to really, I guess, when I went to Diana Krall's um, performances. And, of course, I was already playing then, but I would say she was the one that really blew me away. So I have all her albums. <laughs> yeah, she's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Um, what do you like the best about Kansas City? Oh, uh, I guess because it's kind of a small, big town, and um, I like it because I grew up here. I left for several years to perform down at the Lodge of Four Seasons, down at the Lake of the Ozarks, but that's still the Midwest region, and people are just so friendly. I love Kansas City because it is so uh, arts-based, and, and people don't realize that from other cities. Um, it's really a classy town. You know, when we start thinking about like rebounding and all of that. The thing that, that strikes me about talking to all of the musicians, both locally and even internationally, is, is that, you know, jazz isn't one of these things that you get into for the money. There's a, there's an absolute mm -hmm. love, and it almost seems as though the jazz musicians are probably the most equipped for this because this is, it. what we're dealing with is the ultimate form of improv. This, there's, there's nothing about this that has ever been done before. You know, there's been, people that have recovered from wars and big things like 9-11, but no one's ever dealt with a pandemic like this. And i got to wonder, right. at the end of the day, when we do start resurfacing, have you thought about kind of what is going to be a part of the recovery for jazz musicians? Well, yeah, I've thought about it. And, um, and I'm also really nervous because they're talking about this virus spiking again in early June. And I was kind of thinking, you know, we'd all be out there by then. But I don't know. And being a pianist and a vocalist, um, I've even thought to myself, I may have to do gigs where I can't sing uh, because I have to wear a mask. And luckily, I play the piano. So, you know, I can do that. I mean, I don't know if that's going to happen because usually where I would be sitting, I'm kind of socially distanced from people. But, you know, if servers and other workers have to be wearing masks, I would assume we might too. So. Um, I don't know. I'd like to be really positive about this, but but right now I just don't know. You know, I was talking to a musician just earlier today about, 
you know, I think we're going to have to be in a position of limping along. I was listening to Tim Finn this morning, and he was talking about how knuckleheads is going to do the 10-on-10 thing. There's a possibility that, you know, we can have limited crowds and, and start yes. going. I think that might be what we're going to have to look into is that, you know, we're going to have to start somewhere. We're going to have to get some semblance of things figured out because they were even – he had mentioned that Liberty Hall is not doing good. I mean, who would ever think that Liberty Hall and Lawrence would have any kind of an mm-hmm. issue, you know? So we're getting right. to that point right now where, you know, there's going to be a funding shortage. There's going to be things that are going to be real about this. So, you know, I don't know. That, that might be it. But I guess the one thing I wanted to ask, too, is a little bit of that notion Kansas City was really going through a renaissance. I mean, this is the place that we're seeing mm-hmm. all the musicians here. Things were thriving every night. There was an enormous laundry list of places and things. So just thinking about recovery, I mean, how resilient do you think Kansas City is going to be when we do mm-hmm. actually either start limping along back or coming back full strength? Well, I agree with you. It's going to be that 10-10 thing, you know, 10% of occupancy, and, you know, if a place is a small restaurant or something, that's not going to be very many people. I think a lot of these um, restaurants are going to be doing curbside service for a long time, and that kind of, you know, leaves musicians out of the loop. So I think it is going to be a slow recovery. But I think when we do get there, most people kind of agree it's going to be great guns. Everybody's going to be coming out in droves. So, um, but... Again, I play a lot of private events, and, you know, we're, I'll play for 100, 200 people, um, and this is just changing everything if you have to only do 10% of the occupancy of a room or a venue. So, I mean, and if, if they're not making the income, musicians are usually, you know, the first to go. So how are they going to pay the musicians? I don't know. But I do, I am positive again, that it's going to be great guns when things really get going again at full capacity. So one more part of the COVID thing, when we do get back and we do get full-on, full capacity, what do you hope both the musicians and the crowd realizes from this time away? Well, just from the videos that I've done on social media, it just seems like people are just hungering for, for the arts. For, for music, like I said, all these people who are saying to me, gosh, I've never even heard you before. This, I love this. This is amazing. I can't wait to come out and hear you. I think people are realizing just how important this is. Uh, I mean, this is all bare-bones stuff right now, something we've never been through in our generation. And people are just latching on to whatever they can to feel hopeful and to brighten up their days. And uh, music and art, I think, I think that's what's doing it. We're going through something we've never gone through before, and this is all bare bones stuff, and people need every little little thing that they can latch on to to feel more hopeful, and I think music is it. So I think people are going to really appreciate musicians, and uh, I think it's going to show up when everything gets back to normal. They're going to be coming out to listen to us and uh, to thank us for everything we've done during this time. Final question. Everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're living your life. Who do you think you are? Oh, gosh. Um, well, my father just passed away recently, so uh, right now I'm, I'm helping my family along, helping my mother. So I'm a, I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, um, I'm a mom. And I'm a musician, I'm a creative artist, and throughout my life, you know, I've, this has been so important to me, and there's been times that I've thought, you know, when it gets kind of difficult to get gigs and things, which it does for all musicians, you have to persevere. And several times I've thought, well, I'm going to do something different. I've even gone back to school, uh, but I always end up coming right back to this because this is who I am, a musician, a creative like artist. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, hey, thank Candace, thank you for taking some time out. I really appreciate it. And, oh, thank uh, you, stay Joe. Safe. And yeah. I look forward to seeing you out there performing live, for sure. Well, I sure, I sure appreciate it, and um, I love Neon Jazz. You do 
a wonderful job of um, entertaining and being quite informative with your interviews. Very appreciated. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, our 1,000th, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Overland Park, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Candace for being that very special 1,000th interview for her time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Nice. Neon Jazz.